Hey everyone, it's so good to be back. Welcome to season 3, episode 25 of Sugidama podcast, the podcast about Japanese sake, the drink which is both traditional and innovative and which traces its history for hundreds of years. And today I'm going to start a short series looking at existing sake brewing methods from a historic and taste perspective. But before we talk about it, let me tell you about our sponsor, London Sake, yay, they're still with us, who have one of the widest selections of premium and craft sake available online today. You can choose from over 100 sake from 25 breweries and they will deliver across the UK and many European markets. And if you don't know what sake to choose, you can use simple online tasting notes together with very sensible and affordable food pairings to help you decide. What's more, you can get a 10% discount by just using the code SUGIDAMA, all caps, during checkout. London Sake, making sake simple. My name is Alex and I live in London. I am a certified sake specialist, sake judge, sake educator and sake advocate. Besides this podcast, I have Sugidama blog at sugidama.co.uk where I write about all things sake, publish tasting notes, overviews and information about sake events happening in London and across the UK. As I said earlier, it's so good to be back after a break from blogging and podcasting, but not from sake of course. I have to be honest with you, I felt a bit burnt out after two consecutive seasons of Sugidama podcast, especially after the second one, where I committed to publishing episodes on schedule every other week. And gosh, it was so hard. When I released the last episode of season two with an excellent interview with Andy Travis, owner and director of London Sake, our sponsor, I thought that I would take a few weeks off from podcasting and then start planning season 3 while on holiday. And we went to Latvia uh, for two weeks and it, it was beautiful, beautiful country, beautiful seaside, beautiful food, beautiful beer. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, on Sugidama blog, you probably saw the pictures. But yeah, so we went there and I didn't do much. Uh, just relax and didn't think about anything. In any case, it took me a bit longer that, than I thought for me to, to get back to my laptop and mic to record a new episode. So here I am. While I was on sabbatical, I have noticed a couple of new sake podcasts in town and very welcome. The first one is from Jim Ryan and Andrew Russell. And I admire both of these gentlemen. Jim lives in Yamaguchi Prefecture in Japan and writes about sake for various publications as well as for his own newsletter, Ochoko Times. Andrew was on this podcast in the previous season talking about yeast, the unsung hero of sake brewing. He works at Imada Brewery in Hiroshima Prefecture and has first-hand experience and knowledge in sake making. The podcast is called Sake Deep Dive and... If you like nerdy stuff and a lot of details, and it's really deep dive about our beloved subject, try it. The second podcast is called Sake Unplugged by Cindy and Julia. They both live in Japan and Julia works at the sake brewery at the moment. They are talking about various sake breweries, places, etc. Uh, I'm quite excited that we have more podcasts about sake covering various aspects of this wonderful beverage. So tune in and enjoy. Back to Sugidama podcast. Today I would like to start a new mini-series about sake brewing methods. I have covered this topic before in sake production episodes 4, 6 and uh, 8. But this time I would like to take a bit closer look at various techniques that emerged in sake brewing over its long history and are still used nowadays. But we start with looking at how people discovered alcohol in the first place. Then we will talk about ancient sake brewing and finally move to the existing methods, 
Bodaimoto, Kimoto, Yamaha, and Sokujimoto, wrapping up with some other methods which are not that well known, but still exist. Okay, there's probably no single country or region which we could call the birthplace of alcohol. Various techniques for making it probably appeared independently across the world. The ties between regions were weak and the techniques developed in one place didn't necessarily make it to another easily. Interestingly, the oldest discovered brewery, which was operating 13,000 years ago in a cave in Israel, predates the emergence of agriculture, which started only around 9500 BCE, before Common Era. It led some scientists to argue that the desire for alcohol was the real driver behind the emergence of agriculture and subsequent progress, rather than the surplus of agricultural products that led to the appearance of alcohol. I don't know. Why not? Another interesting fact is that our predecessors developed tolerance to alcohol a long, long time ago, before they actually became humans, millions of years ago. Otherwise, we could not drink it now. Well, in South Asia, the oldest traces of alcohol were discovered in China, of course, and are dated back to 9,000 years ago, 7,000 BCE. Apparently, it was a mixed fermented beverage of rice, honey, and fruit, hawthorn fruit or and grape. So we can see that rice-based alcohol is a very old thing. I'm quite surprised that the oldest alcoholic beverages were more like beer rather than wine, as you would think given that wine is generally easier to make. Probably ancient people noticed some booziness in leftover porridge or they found a way to make a sweet drink from germinated grains which turned alcoholic with time. Cultivation of grapes only started uh, six, eight thousand years ago, a few thousand years after beer or other alcoholic drinks from fermented grains were discovered. And indeed, the first signs of wine found in Georgia are dated 6000 BCE. So while it's a bit counterintuitive, grain-based alcohol probably emerged before wine. It's logical that it eventually appeared in Japan, where rice was one of the key grains. Let's now talk about Asian sake making methods, at least about what we know about them. Um, there are two major obstacles for me here. The first is a general lack of historical records, the further back in history we go. And the second is that most of the information is in Japanese, in which I lack any proficiency. I've been learning the language for the last few years, but I still find it difficult to read even simple texts, not mentioning anything as complex as sake-related literature. So unfortunately, I have to rely on English language sources and occasionally on Google Translate. So let's start with what we know about alcohol making in ancient Japan. If you remember, I mentioned in the first episode that the first even mention of mention mention alcohol drinking in Japan comes from the Book of Wei, a Chinese chronicle covering the period from the end of the 4th century until mid 6th century. But of course, alcohol existed in Japan before that. There are many theories about the origin of sake or alcohol in Japan. And here we have another problem. Sake was the word used in Japan for many centuries, referring to a rice-based alcoholic drink. But in the 19th century, Japan opened up and foreign alcoholic drinks started appearing in the country. They all, as a collective, were also called sake, which means alcohol in general. In order to distinguish them from the national drink, sake made from rice was renamed Nihonshu, translated as Japanese alcoholic drink which is still called sake outside Japan. Confusing, right? Okay. Uh, when we are talking about the history of sake, we mean the history of Nihonshu. But again, 
Nihonshu now is very different from any rice-based drinks made even a thousand years ago. So I will start with sake grandparents, so to speak. First, there is a theory that sake came to Japan from China, in particular from around the Yangtze River, where rice growing began around 4800 BC and the technique how to grow rice came to Japan via Kyushu, the most southern of the four largest Japanese islands, and therefore closest to China. It would be the oldest origin of sake. However, apparently, the theory has a lot of contradictions in it and is not supported much in Japan. No idea what these contradictions are, to be honest, as the theory has been mostly discussed in Japanese sources. Also, it was so long ago, and with no records remaining from that time, it's impossible to say. I've already mentioned the Book of Wei, the oldest mentioning of alcohol drinking in Japan. But before that, we have a discovery of a brewing pit in Japan, which existed around 1000 BC, where fruit and berries based alcohol was brewed. But for some reason, it didn't go further to become a dominant method. Probably because it was difficult to cultivate berries in large quantities. So we can't call this drink a predecessor of sake. There's another theory that sake first was made by God, who is known under several names. Oyamatsumi, Watashi no Okami, or Sakatoki no Kami. The latter means God of sake. So what's the story about Sakatoki no Kami? Why he is a god of sake? I'm simplifying it a lot, and also English sources are almost uh, non-existent for this story. So I'm sorry if my version is a bit incorrect. Uh, anyway, there was another deity, Niningi, who was a grandson of Amaterasu, the sun goddess, and one of the major Japanese deities. He also was the great-grandfather of Japan's first emperor, Emperor Jimmu. So Ninigi was looking for a wife. As it happened, Oyamatsumi, who was a mountain god, Oyama means a big mountain, had two daughters, Konohana Sakuya Hime, the goddess of Mount Fuji, and Iwanaga Hime, a rock princess. There are a few versions of how Ninigi and Sakuya Hime met. In one story, Oyamatsumi sent Ninigi both daughters, and in another version, Ninigi and Sakue Hime met on the seashore and fell in love. In both cases, he rejected Iwanaga in favor of uh, Sakue Hime. His decision had a devastating effect of, on humans. As he rejected rock princess Iwanaga, humans, his descendants, got shorter life, like cherry blossoms, rather than long lives like rocks. So blame him for our mortality. Sakui Hime and Ninigi had a few other dramatic moments in their relationship, including Sakui Hime giving birth in a burning hut with no doors. However, everything ended well, and the couple had three sons. Oyamatsumi was so happy that he became a granddad that he brewed so-called heavenly sake, Amenotamo Zake, to celebrate it. This way he became a god of sake, as he introduced sake to humans. While there is no real evidence of this all actually happened, you are welcome to believe in this version. Okay, before we talk about ancient brewing techniques and another legend involving sake, let me remind you about London Sake, our sponsor, and their huge selection of curated sake sets, which provide a great opportunity to explore various styles and types of sake. Have a look, but don't forget about the magic word Sugidama, all caps, to get your 10% discount. So, what are the ancient sake brewing methods we know about? During the Nara period in the 8th century, rice cultivation in Japan became stable. So, people started having some extra rice they could use for other things. During that time, we have the earliest records of sake-making techniques in Japan. One of them comes from the text about Osumi province, today the eastern part of Kagoshima prefecture. 
written sometime after 713. I have mentioned this method, Kuchikamizaki, before in my earlier episodes. People were chewing uncooked rice and water and spitting it into a vessel. After a few days, amylolytic enzymes, which live in our saliva, break the starch in the rice into sugar, and wild yeast that lives in the air starts uh, converting it into alcohol. This method is known to be widespread across a broad area from East Asia to the South Pacific and South and Central America. It's also implied in Manyoshu, a collection of poems from the same period. There are a few poems that indirectly, as I understand, point to Kuchikamizaki. For example, there is a theory that a Japanese word for brewing, sake, which also sounds like chewing, comes from this particular technique, and uh, this word is used in some poems. Also, there is a poem that suggests that maidens, so like shrine maidens or just maidens, were responsible for chewing the cooked rice. Again, in some sources they mentioned cooked, and in other sources uncooked rice. So probably they did both, though chewing cooked rice is definitely easier. I read about an experiment done by students in Japan to see how strong the sake brewed by the Kuchikamizaki method could be. They managed to make it around 9% ABV. And by the way, you can do a little experiment yourself. Just chew cooked Japanese rice for longer than usual and you will taste some sweetness as the saliva will break the starch in the rice into sugars. So it's quite likely that Kuchikamizaki was a quite common method of making sake for hundreds of years. However, by the time the text was written, it had likely become an old custom that just happened to remain in the remote region of Osumi. So again, it's unlikely that Kuchikamizaki was a real predecessor of modern sake brewing methods. Still, there are accounts of Kuchikamizaki being made and used in Shinto ceremonies on remote Okinawa islands up to the 1930s. There was another record, however, a story written about 716 of a person whose rice bento dried up first and then got wet and after some time became moldy. Instead of throwing it away, he cleverly used the moldy rice to make sake and even had a drinking party afterwards. Here we have pretty much a modern way of sake brewing, in this case using wild koji to break starch into sugars and wild yeast to make alcohol of it. This method is also mentioned in Nihonshoki, and Nihonshoki is a collection of historical texts about Japan, one of the oldest. So it was probably quite common at that time. The sake made this way was called hitoyozake, overnight sake, and over time developed into two types, amano tamu sake and yashiori no sake. Amano tamu sake is actually the sake made by Oyamatsumi the sake god I told you earlier in this episode, there's a theory that it might be a sweet sake similar to amazake but with alcohol. Yashiori no sake is also mentioned in Nihonshiki as well in Kojiki, uh, another earliest historical Japanese text. Yashiori can be translated as eight times pressed or eight times brewed sake. Again, not much is known about this drink, but there's a very famous legend which involves it. The story of a storm god Susano and Yamata no Orochi. Susano no Mikoto was a younger brother of the sun goddess Amaterasu, we have already mentioned before. He was a good lad, but a bit unruly and wild. As a result, he was kicked out of heaven and found himself in Izumi province. There he met a, a nice elderly couple who told him a sad story of losing seven of their eight daughters to Yamato no Orochi, a dragon with eight tails and eight heads. The nasty creature came to them every year and demanded one of their daughters as a sacrifice. And it was about the time 
Yamato no Orochi would come for their last one, Kishinada Hime. Susano had a good heart and he felt sorry for them. Being a god, he had a few tricks in his sleeves. First to be on the safe side, he turned Kishinada Hime into a comb and placed it in his hair. Then he told her parents to make eightfold strong sake called Yashiori. It's not clear what it was. Probably something close to Kijoshu, when sake is brewed with sake, uh, making it stronger. So instead of water, you add sake from previous batch, and then you use this sake to make uh, next batch, so eight times. So probably it was pretty strong sake made by this method. There's a theory also that it might be distilled spirit, but it's quite unlikely, as distillation came to Japan much later. So I don't know, I had an uh, interesting discussion with a friend of mine who lives in Japan and speaks Japanese perfectly about that, and he mentioned few sources in, in Japanese where it's been discussed, uh, uh, what kind of uh, sake uh, it was. So I don't know, it could be anything. I saw on the internet a company which makes Yashiori sake and sells it. Uh, I don't know how they make it, they, there is not much information on their website, but yeah, you can order it if you're in Japan and try. So, when they made it, uh, this sake, Sasuno told the couple to build a large fence with eight gates and raise a platform with a large vat on each of them. In each vat, they poured that strong Yashiori sake and waited for Yamato no Orochi to arrive. The creature didn't keep them waiting for long. Yamato no Orochi liked his drink and as soon as he noticed huge vats with booze, he dipped all his eight heads into the vats and drank the powerful Yashiori no sake. Of course, he became so drunk that he fell deep asleep and Sasuno didn't have any problem with killing him. As a result, some people attribute the invention of sake to Sasuno. Pity he didn't leave any brewing notes to us. The last Asian sake I would like to mention today is shitogi, made from rice flour. Basically, white rice was soaked in water and then ground and the resulted flour dissolved in cold or hot water and left at room temperature for some time letting wild yeast start fermentation. Shitogi may have been used in ritual offerings or during some special events. Asian sake was very different from what we have now. First of all, it was usually cloudy or even more like porridge or soggy paste. I've read in one source that people actually ate sake with chopsticks that time. And it's definitely true. I have once tried nigori sake, which was as thick as custard. However, there are mentions of clear sake, seishu, which was probably either filtered with a cloth or left to stand for a while so all the sediments fall to the bottom of the vessel and clear sake was just scooped from the surface. Secondly, ancient sake had a completely different taste. It was rougher because rice wasn't polished or if polished then just a bit, it was sweeter, it was lower in alcohol content. I guess we will stop here, and we will talk about the emergence of the modern sake brewing technique, uh, which uses rice, water, koji, and yeast in the next episode. By the way, while researching Manyoshu, I found a poem about sake, which I really liked. It goes something like, don't think about trivial things, just have a cup of cloudy sake. Pretty good advice from the 8th century, right? Unfortunately, I cannot feature any Asian sake today. Just don't have any. So I was thinking, it's still winter, and it's the best time for warm or even hot sake. I wrote two posts back in November and December about warm sake, kanzake. The first was about how to enjoy hot sake, and the second featured five great sake to drink warm. You're welcome to read both. But I will feature one sake from that last post here. Jidai Yamahai Junmai Ginjo. At least 
it's Yamahai, which is an old brewing method we're going to talk about in a future episode. The uniqueness of Jidai is that it's a rare ginjo sake, specially made to drink warm. Because generally, people drink ginjo sake chilled, sometimes at room temperature. Jidai is quite versatile. I tried it at various temperatures and it's pretty good at all of them. Chilled, it has high acidity and deep taste, quite common for Yamahai sake. But as you raise the temperature, Jidai becomes more mellow with a luxurious, velvety texture, sweeter and easy to drink. And it holds acidity at a high temperature pretty well. Jidai has a fruity aroma full of apricot, pear, baked apple and a few herbal notes. It has a pretty complex flavor and a long and lavish finish. It's great with hearty winter dishes like beef stew, roasted chicken, fried fish or mushroom risotto, with roasted seasonal vegetables, chips or fried rice. You can buy it from the Tango Sake website and one of the pairing suggestions there is dark chocolate. I haven't tried it, but if you do, please let me know if you like it. That's it for today. I'll be back with more episodes about the evolution of sake brewing methods and very interesting interviews. In the meantime, buy a bottle of sake and try it warm. Read my post with recommendations on sugidama.co.uk or you can look up warm sake at the London Sake website where you can get a 10% discount by entering SUGIDAMA, all in caps, at the checkout. And if you would like to buy Jidai Yamahai Junmai Ginjo, go to the Tango Sake website. I'll put the link in the show notes. If you have any questions or suggestions about any sake topic, just drop me a line. My email address is alex at sugidama.co.uk or you can tag me on Instagram or Twitter at Sugidama blog in one word. Again, if you like the episode and want more, hit the subscribe button and you will get every new episode downloaded in your player as soon as it's out. If you would like to give me a bit of support, please leave a review or rate Sugidama podcast. There are two places you can easily leave a review. On Apple Podcasts, if you use iPhone, iPad or Mac, go to the Sugidama podcast page there, scroll down to the bottom where you can see reviews, there will be a link to add your own review. Another option is the Podchaser website, where you can leave a review of any podcast, regardless of what platform you use to listen to it. I've got a link to my page there in the show notes. You need to register at Podchaser but it's easy because you can use your Twitter or Facebook credentials and then leave a review. Spotify now allows you to rate the podcast you listen to. So if you use this platform, rate Sugidama podcast there. Of course, you can share this podcast with your friends or on your social media, chat apps, anywhere. A lot of people mention a friend's recommendation as a reason for listening to a particular podcast. So you can be that friend and support Sugidama podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. Kampai. Suge 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 dama blog. Suge 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 dama blog.